Well, good morning. Good morning. We're going to look at Psalm 41. Psalm 41 will be our call to worship uh, this morning. Welcome to Brushy Fort Baptist Church. We are excited that you have chosen to worship with us this morning, even though it's cold and rainy. Um, but uh, that happens in the fall, doesn't it? And uh, I, I know that uh, I am thankful for the, the change of seasons. Uh, well, let's look at Psalm 41, the choir master, uh, a psalm of David. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice. When will he die and his name perish? And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words. While his heart gathers iniquity, when he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say, a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. But by this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. But you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Psalm 41 is a uh, petition that we can identify with. When we look out, oftentimes we can see and think that uh, those that do it the wrong way oftentimes get ahead. Uh, and that can be frustrating, uh, can't it? Uh, this psalmist is lamenting that in uh, the first three verses. Uh, but just like we're going to see in 1 John, uh, we have a promise and a blessed hope provided from the Lord. Uh, even though it may seem that uh, people who do it the wrong way get ahead on this earth, uh, they may get ahead for a period, uh, but God is their judge, and there will be a day of judgment, and all things will be set right. And in fact, uh, 1 John encourages us to know uh, where we stand in light of that judgment, to be assured in our position in Christ. And that's what uh, I encourage us to think about and ponder uh, this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you the opportunity to be in your house, Lord, to worship with your people, Lord, to, to sing uh, hymns of praise, and Lord, to, uh, to pray and offer our petitions and our needs and our wants and our desires to you. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with us, Lord, that you would uh, challenge us, and, and Lord, that you would uh, uh, be with us as we walk through the trials of this life. Lord, we pray that you would uh, continue to uh, touch those that are that are hurting, Lord, those that are uh, uh, facing trials and tribulations, Lord, that you would uh, meet their needs. Lord, we thank you that in the your word we have uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ that is good news no matter what circumstance we find ourselves. Lord, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, open our hearts to the truth that is there. And Lord, as we look at, at John's words in the end of 1 John chapter 5, I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to the truth that is there. Lord, that you seek to uh, provide for us encouragement, to, to give us a hope that uh, lasts for eternity. I pray, Lord, that we would be assured uh, of our salvation, not because of our works, but, Lord, because of what Christ has done uh, for us and in us. Lord, we thank you uh, for that. Be with us this morning. I pray, Lord, that our worship uh, would be a... Uh, sweet smell and a, a, uh, a beautiful sound in your ears. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, if you would, turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. And uh, we are going to focus on 18 through 21. But we're going to read, uh, start reading in verse 16. Because uh, even though we covered 16 uh, last week, uh, verse 18 relies heavily on what we see in verse 17. So we at least need uh, to read that. While you're uh, turning there, have you ever uh, received a great blessing and uh, something that that just rather moves you uh, in that uh, this week uh, we had a chance to to get uh, my kids together and my brother's kids together and that is always a lot of fun because there is a bunch of personalities in that group but it is also a blessing uh, to see how those uh, kids interact with each other how all those different personalities uh, sometimes they don't agree sometimes they don't uh, get along perfectly uh, but really they they do a, a really good job of uh, of um, mixing together oftentimes by the end uh, AJ's uh, youngest, Taylor and Owen, uh, they did when they looked at each other, they really didn't know how each one was going to deal with uh, sharing each other's toys. Uh, both of them are about the same age, and they kind of looked at each other suspiciously. You're going to be like my siblings and take my stuff, or what are you going to do? Uh, sometimes the older ones would uh, would shift and and uh, Chloe uh, would be playing with Kara, AJ's oldest, or sometimes uh, Mia would be, and then Chloe would be playing with Andrew, uh, the second oldest. And, and it was just interesting to see how they interacted. Um, and, and that is a blessing. Families are a blessing, aren't they? And, and sometimes when we're able to step back and look at, at how God works and his uh, creativity and, and how he uh, designs us, and, and sometimes even through the chaos of it all, um, we can step back and see how blessed we are. And in a real way, that is what John wants us to step back. This is, this is John's closing statements in the book of 1 John. And he has, he has built an argument and he has uh, given us some instruction about how to think about the secessionists, those that had left the church and were preaching a, a gospel that they said came from the Holy Spirit, that they said came from Jesus, but was different and contrary to the gospel that was preached by the apostles uh, and those that had followed Jesus. And John is warning the church and John is giving them instruction about how to think about that. But John finishes the book with encouragement. He finishes the book with us. Uh, he wants us to know that we are assured in our salvation. He wants us to know that if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we have the promise of eternal life. And that is a great blessing, isn't it? God has blessed us abundantly. Uh, with all the, the turmoil of this life, with all the intricacies, God wants us to step back and see that he has provided us the blessing of eternal life if we would believe in his son. So let's look at starting in verse 16, but we're going to specifically focus on you know, verse eight, verses 18 through 21. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but, we who was, uh, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and, etern and the eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, we thank you 
that it uh, encourages us and it, it uh, prods us to, to stay rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to the truth that is here. I pray, Lord, that we would put our faith in Jesus as the Son of God and rest assured that we have eternal life, Lord, and that you would uh, challenge us to, to think about that in objective standards and not just subjectively. Lord, help us to, to see uh, the message that you have provided to us through uh, the gospel writer John, uh, who also wrote this epistle. Lord, we thank you uh, for that. Challenge us. Lord, I pray that uh, when we leave today, that we'd be more like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, we, chat, we tackled what was this uh, sin that was unto death. And I may not have answered that uh, to your satisfaction. And, and really, I don't even uh, know the answer to my satisfaction. I can't point to a, a specific sin uh, that uh, leads to death. But we do know... That there are sins of, of blasphemy, there are sins of turning our back on God, that, that God does um, call uh, believers home. But we specifically highlighted, hoping that we wouldn't be sidetracked by the question of what is this sin to death, but, but thinking about this in the terms of the context of 1 John, in the, term, in the context of uh, those who were, were being tempted to follow the secessionists, those who were being led astray, who were being called out of the church. And uh, John wants us to, to know that, that we can be rooted in our faith, we can be rooted in our belief and rest assured. So this morning, the big idea that is represented in 18 through 21 is, is the same big idea that we saw last week. We are to put our faith in Jesus as the Son of God. And be assured that we have eternal life. Uh, John wants us to know that we have assurance if we believe in Jesus as the Lord and Savior. We follow him with our lives. Uh, so how do we do that? First, we have to turn to God who is our protector and defender. This is significant because John has just raised this this. Uh, this problem that we've seen, this, this sin unto death. And, and we talked about that in light of uh, those that, that were being tempted and those that were preaching the secessionist gospel. Uh, and uh, I think John is clear here. He's encouraging the church not to, uh, not that it would be a complete waste, but not to focus their time on praying for those that are preaching this gospel because they are set in their ways. In some ways, this would be like casting our pearls before swine. They are decided. Not that they may not be undecided, but the Holy Spirit is going to have to work on them. But Paul, or John wants us to focus on those that are being tempted to leave the church, to pray for them and to intercede for them, and that, that God's Spirit would show them the truth. But one thing that I didn't highlight from verses 16 through 17 is the fact that... Uh, there is, uh, sin should be a significant issue for the Christian. Our desire and our disposition should be to avoid sin, to avoid falling into sin, to avoid falling into temptation. And, and I know that John has even said that that is, um, that is a, a goal that is extremely lofty that we, that we aspire to, but we don't often attain. Uh, we live in a fallen world, and we are tempted by the things of this world, but, but yet that should be our aspiration. And I think John here, uh, uh, again, encourages us to make that our, our aspiration to fight the, the holds of sin that may be in our lives. And then he turns in verse 18. And he encouraged us to turn to God, who is our protector and defender. Look at verse, uh, verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. 
What an amazing promise. And, and, and we see that this follows right on uh, the teaching of, of the sin unto death. What does it mean? We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. That may be a, a challenging word. And, and when we first read that and we, we think about that, we may be drawn to the fact, well, how in the world can I be counted among those who have been born of God? Because I do keep on sinning. I am a sinner. And I don't think John is directing us to think in that pessimistic uh, turn. Of course, he wants us to, to fight against sin in our life. Of course, he wants us to, to resist the temptation of God and to follow Jesus in obedience. He wants us to, to, to grow in our Christian faith and to walk arm in arm in the light with Jesus. But John also recognizes that we live in a fallen world and we are tempted people. And there are times when we fall away, when we give in to that temptation. But thanks be to God that we have a Savior who offers us forgiveness. But think about verse 18. I don't think it, I don't think John is talking about the, the, the Christian who is, uh, falls into temptation, repents, and then comes back. Here I think he specifically is talking about those who have heard the message of the secessionists and that they have gone out of the church. If we look back, to 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. And uh, fortunately, in my Bible, if I just flip the page, it's right at the same place where I was reading. So I don't know if that works out for you. But uh, 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Here, I think John is highlighting that truth again. John wants us to see that those that are being tempted by the secessionists to leave the church, those that are, are uh, making steps towards doing that, John wants us to pray for them. But not only that, he wants us to realize that if they truly know Jesus, if they have followed him, even if they step foot and they give in to that temptation, God is going to lead them back to the church. I think what John is distinguishing here is... That, of course, everyone who has placed their faith in Jesus, who has been born of God, should seek to fight sin in their life. But I think what John is, is rising to the top here and, and is wanting to emphasize is that those who have been born of God that hear the message of the secessionists, that are even tempted and may even dabble in that for a time, they will not keep on sinning. The spirit of God that was that is within them will not allow them to forsake the gospel of Jesus Christ. That spirit that is within them will overcome the temptation that is within them and they will leave the, the temptation of the secessionists where they will leave uh, the dabbling in that. Here, John wants us to know that if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, there is a safeguard there. We have the Holy Spirit within us that is working within us. And even if we give in to temptation, and even if we dabble with something that the Word of God commands us to stay away from, and not that John is encouraging us to do that. John wants us to, to keep away from that. But, but John wants us to know that if we are a child of the king, then we will not stay in that position. We will repent and we will follow Jesus. I think he's following in line in what he'd already said in verses 219. Those that leave the church, those that are, that are drawn away by the secessionists, and they never come back, they left us because they were not part of us. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to draw them back to the truth. And he's going to finish this, uh, this passage by talking about the truth. But here, here he wants us to know that, that if we have the Holy Spirit, we have a bulwark against falling and continuing into uh, apostasy or, or falling into and continuing in uh, uh, a false teaching. The, the Spirit of God will save us from that. 
And here's what he bases that promise upon. But he who was born of God protects him. This is a challenging phrase. Because who is he talking about? He, he tells us, he uses some pronouns here. But he, who's the he? And who is the who was born of God? Because he's talked about the Christian people as those who have been born of God, just in the last phrase. We know that everyone who is born of God does not keep on sinning. That is the Christian church. But here, I think he changes gears just slightly by introducing this he. But he, who is the he? I think John is referring to the person of Jesus Christ. But he, Jesus, who was born of God, the only reason that we are born of God is because Jesus was first born of God and offers us that uh, relationship with God the Father, isn't it? Uh, it is all, we only have a relationship with God the Father because Jesus provides the, the bridge of that gap. Uh, if, if you're familiar with the Navigator track, uh, uh, you'll see on the Navigator track that, that uh, there is two uh, stone bluffs that are drawn there. And there is no bridge. And, and in that, between those two bridges, there is humanity and there is God. And in the middle of that, they oftentimes write out sin or, or different sins. And those sins are what uh, separate us between those two bluffs. But Jesus came and he died for our sins. And the cross of Jesus is the bridge by which we, those that are separated from God, are able to cross into the presence of God. It's the same uh, idea here. He who was born of God, the, the original one who was born of God, Jesus Christ, who provides us with the opportunity to be born of God, he is the one who protects him. He is the one who protects him who is being tempted. John wants us to realize that God is actively uh, interceding on our behalf. We may have a moment of weakness in which the lies of this world have a, a, have a ringing in intonation in our ears and we are enticed to follow them but but john wants us to know that it it is he who was originally born of god it is jesus christ who protects us and how does he protect us and the evil one does not touch him how does jesus protect his sheep Jesus died in their place. And because of Jesus' death, Jesus conquering sin, Jesus conquering Satan's uh, temptation, Jesus doing everything that we failed to do, Jesus is the one who is able to protect us because he is able to protect us from Satan and the evil one who seeks to do us harm. It is clear throughout the Gospel of John and this first epistle, that anytime John uses the words evil one, he's referring to Satan and his power. John wants us to know that if we are in Jesus, if we have been born of God, if our faith rests in Jesus Christ, then we are protected from the, the temptation and the problems of the evil one. That doesn't mean that, that we can't be deceived and, and drawn in, but what that, that does mean is that we will not continue and stay in the lies of the evil one. The evil one is not our father. But because of Jesus, God is our father. And because Jesus is our protector, he is the one who protects us from the, uh, the onslaught of the evil one. We do not have to worry that we will die in the penalty of our sins because Jesus has overcome the evil one and he protects those that are his from the touch of the evil one. That is a blessed promise. John wants us to place our faith in Jesus and because of our, our faith in Jesus to be assured of our eternal life. And how do we have that assurance? How do we know that we know that we know that we are his? It's not based on a feeling within us. It's based on what Jesus has already done. 
You see, the Son of God who overcame the evil one is our protector and he is our defender. He is the one who keeps us from the evil one. He keeps us from the penalty of Satan's onslaught. He keeps us from the penalty of dying in our trespasses and sins. And if we, if we mess up, if we get distracted in our Christian walk, we have the hope of, of uh, repentance that, that if we call out to Jesus that he will forgive us and that we can turn back and follow him. Why? Because Jesus is still our protector and defender. John wants us to know that our assurance of our salvation does not rely on some subjective feeling in our hearts. Because that comes and goes, doesn't it? There are some days that we wake up and we feel far from God and we don't feel like we're a child of the King. John wants us to know that even on days when we don't feel like it, Jesus is our defender if we have placed our faith in him. If we are following him. So first, we have to turn to God who is our protector and defender. Second, we need to rest in the assurance of our relationship, connection to God. We need to, to rest in the fact that we can walk arm in arm with the Lord. Look at verse 19. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now, what is John trying to tell us? Notice that in verse 18, he tells us we know that. And here again in verse 19, he tells us we know that. In fact, he's going to say that three times, and there, these are three important messages for our assurance. We know that we are from God. Well, how in the world do we know that we are from God, especially if we're still able to sin and give in to temptation? Well, we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. How do we know that we are from God? Because the Holy Spirit bears witness to man. John has already said, and he wants us to, to, to rethink about in verse 19, that, that because of the Holy Spirit's work in our life, because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, if we, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, he now lives within us, that because of the work of the Holy Spirit, we know that we are from God. We know that we have a relationship with, with Jesus. Again, John doesn't want us to be distracted by some subjective feeling, but John wants us to be rooted in an objective truth that if we have placed our faith in Jesus and if we seek to follow him, then we are from God. We have that relationship with Jesus and, and all the blessings that come along with that. Like he's already said, we don't have to shrink back in fear from the presence of God. Jesus has cleansed us and we can walk arm in arm with each other and with Jesus in the light in the presence of God the Father. This is a blessed promise. So, so we know, we have assurance because we know that we are from God. How do we know that? The Holy Spirit bears witness to that in our hearts and we also understand, we also see what God has done in us. We see that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But yet we are separated from the world. No longer are we held captive by Satan and his lies. God has objectively rescued us from Satan's grasp. Everything else in this world lies under the authority of Satan. But if we are found in Jesus, 
then we know that we are from God and we do not have to worry about living under the power of the evil one. Yes, we need to be vigilant that we don't give in to his temptations. Yes, we need to be vigilant that we don't uh, succumb to the lies of a false doctrine. But ultimately, it, it isn't our power, it's the power of God and the Holy Spirit that is at work in us. So secondly, we have to rest in the assurance of our relationship and connection to Jesus and to God. We have to rest assured that that relationship is there because of the power of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, in verse 20, we need to follow in the revelation of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So, we see the third and we know. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. So again, John doesn't want us to be focused on some subjective standard, but in, on an objective fact. And we know, those of us who, who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. How do we know that? Well, the Holy Spirit has taken the blinders off of us, just like uh, blind Bartimaeus or one of the other uh, blind people that Jesus encountered in his earthly ministry that he healed. Jesus took those uh, the blindness off of of not seeing correctly who God and who Jesus is, and we now see Jesus for who He is. We have uh, we have uh, asked and sought Him as our Lord and Savior. We have received the understanding to know Jesus, and not just to know about Him, but to know Him personally. So there is an objective standard. If we believe what Jesus has said uh, he came to do and that he has accomplished that and we have placed our faith in him, we trust him for our eternal life, then we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding because that only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then John goes on, so that we may know him who is true. Again, John wants us to be captivated by the objective nature of this. How do we know him who is true? Well, John has made a big deal out of this. We've talked about John 14, 6. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he, um, I just lost it. I'll have to turn back to it. Don't you hate when your brain gives out? <laughs> it, it happens to the best of us, doesn't it? It even happens to young people. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John has already said that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. So, so that we may know him who is true, how do we know that? Well, we know that because we have uh, received the understanding through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on, and we are in him who is true. Not only do we know him who is true, not only do we, do we cerebrally understand that, but, but we have taken it a, a step further. We are in him. We have a relationship with him who is true. And, and John has also gone into great detail about what does it mean to be in uh, if we look at chapters 2 and 3, and you look back at those messages, John has talked about being in the Father and in Christ, and, and we are in all three together. A relationship with one of them means we have a relationship with all of them. And if, if we're in Jesus, Jesus is in the Father, and we're in the Father too. And, and if we're, uh, we have a relationship with the Father, He's in Jesus, and, and we have a relationship. It's talking about those relationship connections. So that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true. We have a relationship with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. And we are connected to them through the relationship building power of Jesus Christ. And John proves this with his next statement. In his Son, Jesus Christ. We are in him who is true. How? In his Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Just like that navigator track 
where we are separated from God. The bridge to that relationship is the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who provided the bridge for us to get to God in relationship. And then he closes verse 20 by telling us he is the true God and eternal life. John wants the church of Asia Minor to know. Don't follow the teaching of the secessionists. Stay true to the truth once delivered by the apostolic witness. Stay true to what has been given. Stay true to your first love. But know that you can be assured of your salvation because you have a relationship with God. And you know him who has been born of God, and he who has been born of God protects you. And that, that you have that relationship with God. We are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We've been rescued out of the, the snare of Satan. We have been rescued out of his authority. No longer can his hands touch us in a way in which we will receive judgment for all eternity. And then in verse 20, he tells us that we can be assured of our salvation because we are in relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit through the mighty works of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus. He is the true God and eternal life. John wants us to know he wants us to be assured of our salvation. We don't have to worry about our protection. Jesus has taken care of that. We don't have to worry about uh, Satan having his grips upon us and having his power because God uh, is the one we are now found in him. And we do not have to worry about uh, having a relationship with God because he has provided that relationship through the person of Jesus Christ. So he has given us three things to do. To turn to God who is our protector and defender. To rest in the assurance of a relationship, connection to God. And to follow in the revelation of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. To rely on those three objective things. And then he gives us something extremely powerful. Look at the very last words he leaves us with. Little children, Again, he harkens back to that precious uh, statement, that precious, endearing statement that he's used before. And we've looked at the fact that he's earned the right. John is, is aged in his ministry. He's much older probably than most of the people who are hearing this letter. He is a grandfather in the faith. And he looks at all of the people of the church of Asia Minor and he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. His last word of encouragement, his last thing is an encouragement to us. Keep yourselves from idols. What does John mean? John has just held up all the benefits that we have in Christ. We don't have to, to worry about Satan getting his hands on us. We don't have to worry about our eternal security. We don't have to worry about our relationship being broken. Why do we not have to worry? Because of Jesus Christ. And John leaves us with the, the last part of this letter. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. John's encouragement to us is to stay focused and grounded on Jesus. If we look to Jesus, we're not going to be distracted by Satan's lies. We're not going to be distracted by the, the preaching of the secessionists. If it's only when, like Peter, we get outside the boat and we take our eyes off Jesus that we start sinking, isn't it? John wants us to stay focused. Don't be distracted. Keep yourselves from idols. And what is an idol? An idol is anything that would take our focus off of Jesus Christ. Anything can become an idol in our life if it will take our eyes off of Jesus. John tells us, if you want to be assured of your salvation, put your eyes on an objective standard. Don't, don't get bogged down by the subjective feelings of your soul. But keep your eyes on Jesus and he will save you. 
you keep your eyes on Jesus, then you won't fall into the water like Peter did when he was out of the boat. John wants to encourage us. How do we live this Christian life? How do we, how do we live this life in which we may be tempted to, to, to understand who and what to believe? John ends this with the encouragement. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. He's the one you can trust. There's, Jesus doesn't have any uh, ulterior motive. He doesn't have an angle that he's working towards. Jesus has come as the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's not trying to deceive us. He's not trying to, to lead us astray. If we keep our eyes on Jesus then we will find the path that does not lead to destruction. We will find a relationship with God and we will not be led astray. What is the key to the Christian life? The key to the Christian life is keeping our eyes on Jesus. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. John's words to us this morning are to stay vigilant. Yes, to, to fight the good fight, to, to resist temptation, to resist being led astray, but to keep our eyes on the objective things. To keep our eyes that we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. Why? Because he was born of God. God protects him. Rest assured in the protection of God. The evil one has no power to overcome the power of God. We know that we are from God because we have a relationship with him. We are connected to him. And the, 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 power, the evil one cannot overpower him. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. We know that we are a child of the King because we know Jesus for who he is. And he is the bridge by which we find ourselves able to be in the presence of God. He's the one true God. He is our eternal life. So John encourages us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus. That's the first step. Uh, you have to come to realize that you're a sinner uh, that is separated from God. Uh, John's words of encouragement are not true for you if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you've never asked him to forgive you and you've never uh, told him that you want to follow him with the rest of your life. John here wants you to know that you can have hope of eternal life. But that hope comes through the person of Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to find me after the service, and I'd love to share with you more about how you can have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Paul or John's words are clear to us. Keep our eyes on Jesus. He will lead us through all the distractions that come about. And there's plenty of distractions in this life, aren't there? But if we keep our eyes focused on him, we uh, can, can remain confident in his truth and in his understanding. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, I pray that we would rest assured of our, our, our salvation. Lord, those of us who know you as our Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that Satan's attempts to discourage us, Lord, Satan's attempts to, to uh, lead us astray, Lord, that we would, uh, we would resist them. And Lord, if, if we have dabbled in temptation and dabbled in, in following after the, the lies of this world, I pray, Lord, that through the power of your spirit that you would lead us to repentance and that we would come back and follow you. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to worry about the penalty of our sins. Lord, that you have overcome that. You have saved us from that if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Lord, the hope that you have given us is, is a blessed hope. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you feel like the Lord is leading you to have a personal relationship with Him, then let me just share with you the best news. To share with you the best news, I have to share with you the bad news. The bad news is that we are sinners uh, and we fall short of the glory of God. Paul tells us, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That means that that relationship in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that Adam and Eve had, that they had, were in relationship with God, that means that our sins break that relationship. Just like Adam and Eve rebelled against God, we are sinners too and we rebel against God and that relationship is broken. That's bad news, but that's not the worst news. The worst news is we can't fix that relationship. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That means uh, the, what we have earned by our sin is death, and we can't change that. That's depressing. That's hard. But God doesn't leave us there. Thankfully, He gives us good news, even amongst this bad news and the worst news. God gives us good news, and the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus came he died on an old rugged cross. He, would, he lived the perfect life that God called us to. He died on our behalf. And, and Jesus offers us the free gift of eternal life. He offers us salvation. That's the good news. But the best news is that Jesus' offer can be applied on our account. We can know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We can have that relationship restored. How do we do that? We do that by faith. Faith is an odd word, but it simply means trust. I'm trusting that the seat that I'm sitting in is going to keep me off the floor. We have to place our faith. We have to trust that Jesus is who he says he is and he did what he said he did. We have to trust that. And we have to trust that He will honor His promises, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We express that oftentimes by praying. So if you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to pray a prayer uh, something like this, where you uh, tell God that you recognize that you are a sinner. And that your sins have separated and broken that relationship with him. And to tell him that you're sorry. And, and to realize that Jesus uh, came to be the answer. He came to, to die and to live the perfect life and to die in your place. And that you are accepting, you believe that Jesus did that. And you want his death to be applied to your account. You want the forgiveness of your sins. And you want to follow Jesus in obedience the rest of your life. If you've made that decision, would you reach out to us? Would you email us at info at brushyforkbaptist.com or contact us on Facebook? We'd love to hear that you've made a, a commitment to follow the Lord. God bless.